So um, I wasn't sure what to call this, and I decided I would just call it water because uh, there's a lot of things in here, and I'm, I'm going to bounce all over the place. Essentially, what I did to prepare for this is I just got a ton of slides from various projects and dumped them all into a presentation. So it's probably too many slides, but I'll um, zip along. Let's see. I'm going to introduce Eric first, and then I'll introduce myself and talk a little about some of the projects that I worked on. Um, I'll introduce Arab and some of our, our projects generally. This is uh, so Sir Ove Arab, and he was uh, he's a Danish guy who started his practice in England. Um, and when he died in he died in the 80s, maybe in the late 70s, uh, he donated Arab essentially to his employees. So Arab is not publicly owned. It's a uh, um, essentially a large co-op, employee-owned company, um, which is really nice. It means that everybody at Arab is, has um, an investment in, in what we do. And I've worked at other large engineering firms, and like Acom, and uh, I found that the, the, the links and the bonds around that, that we establish in Arab globally, I've also worked in Arab's um, Hong Kong office and San Francisco office. Um, you can call up anybody, and everybody's really willing to like pitch in and like, you know, make it make it work. So that's something nice about Arab, and and I think it makes our project special. We are global. Um, Eleven thousand people at Arab um, in ninety offices, and we you know do full service engineering design in all kinds of disciplines, um, from buildings, infrastructure. I mostly work in the water practice. I'm going to get into a little bit more about what we do. <coughs> Um, that's where we are. We do have an office in Houston, um, but we're mostly on the on the coast in the U.S. And we have some offices up in Canada. Um, the good presence out in Asia, obviously in in, in Europe, uh, a lot of offices. That's where we started, and we're just starting to get into South America and um, South Africa, mostly southern part of Africa. Although Ghana seems to be a place where there where there's up and coming projects um, happening quite a lot these days. I'm from the Los Angeles office, and we have a huge range of uh, services that come out of the, the Los Angeles office, um, pretty much all of them. Uh, in Engineering News Record, recently named our um, design firm of the year in 2013, and it's I think it's a, a tribute to the work that we've done, because we only started in, in the US in, in the late 80s. So coming from competing with um, you know all the well-established firms, um, it's really nice to, to sort of be recognized as being on top of our game, um, at least in parts of the U.S. and well, pretty much everywhere in the U.S. So we have three core practices, uh, buildings. You'll recognize some of these. Sir Ovarif was the engineer who got the um, Sydney Opera House to finally work after about 15 years of um, going through all these various iterations of that design. Uh, this is the new Guggenheim um, Abu Dhabi, I believe. Um, Sands Hotel, Resort, and Casino in Singapore, Beijing, uh, First Nest Stadium, and that's Our Lady of the Angels Church in Los Angeles. Just some of the iconic buildings that we do. Um, some of you have worked on with Eric on other iconic buildings, I think, here in San Antonio. Um, yes. Which one was it? Beethoven. Beethoven. Okay, I'm not familiar with that one. But yeah, secret Yeah. Uh, so buildings practice. We have a consulting practice, and they do all kinds of things: um, fire modeling, acoustic modeling, um, building energy modeling. There's a lot of really um, real specialists at Arab who who do these types of things. Um, if any of you ever have a chance to come to an Arab office and experience our, our acoustics lab, it's really quite a fascinating. Have you been to one, James? One in New York. It's yeah. it's a really fascinating experience. You get to sit in these um, digital spaces, essentially, and, and you can locate yourself anywhere in a building. You can change the facade types and hear what a violin sounds like playing from that corner of the building while you're sitting over here in that corner of the building and, and um, kind of and immerse yourself in that audio experience. Uh, so our consulting practice also does sustainability. Um, so on our master planning projects, we'll do sustainability consulting. Um, Mostly on our planning project, the sustainability practice works. 
And then infrastructure, which is where I sit. Um, we do a lot of big infrastructure. Trans uh, in California, we're really big in transport right now. Um, working on California High Speed Rail. Um, we do a lot of bridges and highways. We didn't build the Golden Gate Bridge, but we did. <laughs> we did the approach to the Golden Gate Bridge, which has two new tunnels. Um, it's called Doyle Drive. And if, you, if any of you have been to San Francisco, you know that currently the, the approach is essentially an elevated causeway that essentially blocks off the Presidio from Chrissy Field. There are two really nice parks um, in San Francisco, and so this brings the roadway underground in portions connecting those two parts to each other and creating some nice public space. That's the new Gerald Desmond Bridge in uh, Long Beach in California. We also do, we've done a lot of, a lot of bridges in, in the US and, and abroad. Uh, Lake Mead, I'll talk about that in a minute when I get to the water part. So Eric, water, what do, what do we do? So, all right, this is where you guys get to interact with me. So what are some of the ways that you interact with water? Just drink, shout out, drinking water. They, Bathing water, washing water, okay. Irrigation. So, irrigation, okay. These are all things that we need water for. Recreation. Recreation. It's a good one. Yeah. Float down it in a riverboat. Float down a riverboat. Sounds like recreation to me. Transportation. Fishing. Transportation. Yeah. Okay. That's a that's a, a, a one space that conditioning. Pardon? Space conditioning. Space conditioning. Yeah. Another water use. Yeah. Food. What about getting what about getting rid of water? Flushing it down the toilet? Yeah. Mm -hmm. space. Yeah. Dumping it out. Um, and then like today, raining, you know, interacting with water, getting wet outside when it's raining. So essentially those are the four areas of we, we named them water supply and demand, everything that we need water for, wastewater, getting rid of the water after we use it. Um, Surface water management, that's all relating to when it falls and we don't know what to do with it. And we've got to figure out how to clean it and make sure it doesn't flood. And then environment ecology, I kind of put the recreation into that category, floating down a nice river, going fishing. So air water works in all these four um, areas and I, I tend to call them the four pillars of, of integrated water management. And if you look at the services that we provide, within those areas. They're quite diverse. Um, up, in, up in the water supply section, um, water supply and demand assessments, dams and reservoirs, tunnels for big, for big uh, water delivery projects, desalination, those all fall in water supply, wastewater treatment, alternative analysis. We, we do design wastewater treatment plants too, not in the US so much, but um, internationally we do. Um, constructed wetlands for treating wastewater. Then you get into the environment and ecology section, Things here like limnology. Anyone know what limnology means? No? Yeah, I usually get blank faces. About <laughs> the last time I spoke, somebody knew, he was Greek. It comes from the Greek limnos, meaning uh, a lake or a pond. So the study of reservoirs and, and management of reservoirs and, and water bodies. Um, wetland river restoration, that would fall into those categories. And then surface water management, management that's like flood risk assessments. Um, hydrology and hydraulics, coastal engineering, we have a big maritime group that does you know, coastal protection and sediment transport um, uh, along the coast. And then I think there's, a, when you put those together, uh, master planning projects, that's what we would call integrated water management, essentially looking at how all of those systems interact and how you can kind of work with synergies between water supply and wastewater um, and get sort of the maximum benefit out of those things. And then the surrounding uh, circle out there is energy systems. So how, do, how does the water interact with energy? And that's actually one of the areas that I do a lot of research in within ARAP is looking at embodied resources within resources. If we have time, I've got a bunch of slides on it at the end. We'll see if we get there. It's actually quite interesting in answering some of the questions about how do we achieve maximum resource efficiency um, based on, how, on where we're spending money, like in a building, if we change the light bulb as opposed to uh, turning it to going to a, an efficient fixture, what actually does the most benefit to us on a full resource efficiency um, sort of cradle to cradle type analysis? Okay, some of our major projects, I've just put a few of them here Lake Mead intake. San Antonio is too far from Lake Mead to get any water from there, from there, but it's really important to where I live, Southern California. I live miles away from this place, but somehow the water makes it out over to Los Angeles. Um, they were having a seven-year drought, needed new intake, 
and uh, we came up with a solution that went three miles underground to a deep intake shaft in the bottom of the lake so that we could make, we could draw down even further, <laughs> lose even more water. But that's being built, not yet open. I think they're somewhere near Breakthrough now, um, if not already at Breakthrough in the shaft uh, in, in the lake. So that's a major water project that we've done in the U.S. Um, so did the vertical shaft already exist? No, and you're just that tying has to be built. It? So that has to be built at the end. Yeah. Mm, underwater. That's the, I mean, it was huge. A ton of boring machines, um, maybe 15 feet tall, a meter tall. Uh, so they get the ton of boring machine down into this shaft and then they do directional boring up to here and there's another shaft and it breaks through. Pretty impressive project actually. Um, we do desalination facilities. Here's an example of a um, desalination plant that our, our Australian colleagues are working on. We haven't done one in the U.S. We'd like to um, bring that experience to the U.S. Um, I just came from Hong Kong and actually did a bit of work on this project, which is the Ty Typo water treatment plant. So this is again a water supply project. Um, actually, there's a lot of really nice uh, sustainable design features that are going into this project. Um, it's in very early stages right now, um, but it's, it's, a, it's one of the major treatment plants for Hong Kong. And wastewater treatment. Uh, this is a major wastewater treatment facility in Eshel uh, in the UK. One of the nice things about this one is um, it's one of the first instances of using uh, raw wastewater to produce hydroelectric power. So even before it goes through the treatment process, they put it into a, a, it's a reverse Archimedes screw. So the Archimedes screw is the kind of a screw that takes water up out of, usually they use them in irrigation channels and things. Well, this one's flowing the opposite way. There was a bit of head that they could use coming into this facility and they used the raw wastewater to actually produce electricity to help with power. It doesn't offset the entire facility uh, energy use, but um, one, of, one nice unique thing that we put into that project. Um, another project that I worked on, on when I was out in Hong Kong, so I just got back from Hong Kong. I was, I was there for two and a half years and I've been back in the U.S. now for about four months, so it's uh, still pretty recent, is we do a lot of resilience um, work and that's mostly looking around climate change resilience for flood risks uh, in, in urban cities and we're working on, on two kind of major initiatives, which one is the ACCRN, which is Asian Climate Change Resilience Network, and, and then one for the C40 cities. So we look at how you can plan infrastructure and essentially create safer and more resilient cities um, to intense rainfall, sea level rise. Um, sometimes some of these places are also sinking to compound those measures, those risks. Um, I think this one is, is re relevant to the work that we're actually doing now together with Tim and James out in, in China and Lauren and Sam. Um, and this is New Songdo City. It's in South Korea. It's built, now I think I have some built pictures of it. Yeah, so there's some of the during construction and I think now post construction. And if you browse around on the web, actually you can see people partying their stuff now, so it's all of it. Um, but this was bringing in uh, river water from, it's actually a tidal estuary and bringing it into the city. Um, and there's a whole series of treatment steps that they go through to bring it into this nice lagoon to make sure it's nice and clean um, and activating their urban environment. Um, a really successful project, one that we talk about a lot and um, I think people enjoy now, which is good. And another kind of smaller restoration project, this is the Athon Brennig River Restoration in Wales. Athon. 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 Pronounced I don't know. River. Okay. You've got river, Brennan, river. Oh, so that's, yeah? Okay. I don't need the river? Yeah. Okay. So the top left is sort of what it looked like before. You can see it's just going through, um, just, you know, through the town. It looks like it's almost a street. And it's not that much change, but it's actually significantly improved here. Um, there's little bits of uh, natural area, there's bars and channels and none of that was really apparent in the last one. So if, even though it's a very confined project, it was about 200 meters of doing 
as much geomorphological restoration as we could so that the channel could essentially find, have a more natural, um, just operate in a more natural manner. Okay, so that was just a little bit about Arab water, and I just wanted to just hit a few projects that might be interesting, but then I also want to tell you a little bit more about the projects that I'm more intimate with, um, and just tell you a little bit about myself. So, prior to joining Arab in Los Angeles, I worked in their Hong Kong office for two and a half years, and I worked in their San Francisco office for three years. I also worked with um, EDAW, which then got gobbled up by AECOM, uh, and I was with them in Shanghai for three years, so I've now spent a good five and a half years in Asia, um, and I can't seem to get away. <laughs> uh, and then my education, um, I'm a Master of Science in Ecological Engineering, all, all, I, would, I did all my studies at UC Berkeley, um, Bachelor of Science in Conservation and Resource Studies, focused in aquatic ecology, um, I also have a Bachelor of Arts in Physical Geography, and I actually focus in oceans and coasts in physical geography. So all of my education has been towards sort of water management and, and it's still what I'm doing. Um, but more from, from, not only from the, from the engineering, from the ec ecological perspective, but from the engineering perspective. Now when I got my engineering degree, because I went out into the world after getting my bachelor's degree, and not only was I sort of unemployable, just to be able to point to all the problems, but I didn't really have the solutions. So it's, it's really nice to have that understanding of the natural system processes as well as the ability to have a toolbox of engineering tools that you can then do something with um, and, and make some differences. But I'm also a father, anchor, surfer, uh, maybe I'm a naturalist, I guess I <laughs> with my family, my little boys, two and a half. Um, yeah. Back to the core stuff. So uh, this, is, this goes way back, but I, I actually started a lot of my um, work in lakes and reservoirs and understanding nutrient dynamics and how to manage uh, essentially surface waters for water quality, um, odor and taste problems. This lake was having, this is Upper San Leandro Reservoir, just outside, it's where it open gets all of its water. They were having taste and odor problems. Does anyone know what geosmin is? It's a compound that's produced by um, uh, blue-green algae and they live all over in the watershed. And you can taste geosmin, you put a drop of geosmin into a stadium the size of the Rose Bowl, you would be able to taste it, you'd be able to detect it in your drinking water. So this was all about trying to find ways, this project was about trying to find ways to get rid of uh, geosmin in the reservoir, because it's very expensive to treat afterwards once it gets into the system. Um, an interesting fact, I didn't know, I'm, I'm digressing, I, I probably shouldn't go into this, but I, I think you'll find this interesting is that um, geosmin is in the soil, and when a storm comes in, um, when the air pressure changes, the barometric pressure drops, it sucks the air out of the soil, and that earthy smell that you can smell um, before it rains is geosmin. It kind of like, it's beady, it tastes like beets, yeah. kind of earthy, um, so you can smell the storm coming. Um, but uh, this is some of the work I did in San Francisco. I won't go into too much detail about this, actually. Um, more limnology stuff. I'll get into the more interesting stuff here later on. So I think when I went to Shanghai is really when I started getting into more of the engineering work. Um, I wrote a book with the Ministry of Forestry out there. It was called The Wetland Restoration Handbook. Um, and I also, I initially went out there for a few months and then decided uh, to stay after I won a bid to do a treatment wetland at the Shanghai Chemical Industrial Park, which was 32 square kilometers of industrial facilities uh, just outside of Shanghai, and we did a constructed wetland that treated 20,000 cubic meters per day of industrial wastewater. I've got some pictures of it in here. Uh, something else, I'm gonna skip that, I'll come, maybe I'll come back to that. Oh, yeah, here's the Shanghai Chemical Industrial Park. Shanghai's here. Um, the, the industrial facilities, facilities are down here. Um, so I ended up staying three years in Shanghai because of this project. I designed it and saw it built. It was built in 2007, it was completed in 2007. Um, already pre-treated wastewater comes down into some trickling filters down in here and it flows all the way up and around to the end. Um, we had some research wetlands and then some COD degradation ponds. That's a particular problem with the industrial wastewater. It has a lot of COD in it. 
chemical oxygen demand. Um, and then it went into free surface uh, wetland. By the time it got over to the visitor center, it was clean enough for people to be hanging out and around. Um, and apparently now all workers do go there for lunch, which is nice. And here's a few images, I think, of it built. So it's a nice facility using ecology to provide services. Um, and it was recently published, actually this year, finally, uh, in, in about resilience and ecology and urban design. Um, there's, a, there's a chapter in there about the SCIP wetlands. Let me go back to that other interesting thing here. So a lot of the China work, as many of you will know, is very large planning projects. Um, this is a project from very far up in the north in a place called Dangdong Ching Changbo. Uh, and so what we do on these types of projects is look at environmental, um, essentially existing conditions, slope biodiversity, water system, settlements, other kinds of things, and, and do a site suitability analysis, um, looking at essentially put all those things together what areas are most sensitive, and then from what areas are most sensitive, you can turn it into what areas are best to be developed. Um, so we do a development suitability analysis looking at all of these um, constraints. Otherwise, you'll find that you'll, you know, people will just go in and start building the cities all over the place, which does happen as well. Okay, let's get through the SCIP. Okay, back to the US. Um, so after, seeing that Shanghai Chemical Industrial Park project built, um, and it's now in operation, and I'm actually really happy that it's, it's treating water to the levels that we wanted it to. It's re removing 70% of the COD, which is the big problem that was our main target. And um, last I checked, last I got water quality data, it was, it was um, operating quite well. Uh, came back to San Francisco, and that's when I joined ARA. Um, and one of the first projects I started working on was a master planning project called Candlestick Point, Hunters Point Shipyard. Candlestick Park um, is down here, and they're going to, they think, eventually get rid of it and build a new stadium up here. Um, so there's stadium options and non-stadium options. But I think it's a nice project because it does dem demonstrate that idea of integrated water management. And essentially, the way I conceive integrated water management is this. It's taking all four of those pillars of, of water resources and finding the synergies between them. Um, I'll just point to a couple of examples. So if we take water supply and we reduce um, our, let's see, reduce consumption, essentially reducing flows. So this is a synergistic relationship between water supply and wastewater. By reducing consumption, we don't have to treat as much wastewater so we're improving the situation with the wastewater system. Um, between wastewater and ecology, uh, there should be a line natural treatment system. So using constructed wetlands for doing our wastewater work is an enhancement of ecology, uh, but it also is a good choice for wastewater treatment because it doesn't use as much, as much energy. So there's synergistic, synergistic relationships between all of these. Rainwater harvesting would fit in there, so it does some of our stormwater management work, but also is an alternative water supply. So, that's kind of the idea behind integrated water management. I'll leave this slide with you. You can study it in depth in the future, but there's a lot of different things that we can do. And like I, like I mentioned as well, with the energy systems, energy recovery from waste, from, from water, in so many different ways, you can um, not only recover, uh, and essentially, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, kinetic energy, but you can also recover heat. You can do things like digesting it. There's organic material in there and get energy from that. One of the new things that people are doing, I haven't worked on one of these projects, but it's a, I think it's a really good example of a, a way to sort of expand these synergies, is recovering energy from sewer systems. So actually doing water heating from, uh, from raw sewage, which might have a little bit of a, new, a, a yuck kind of factor, but something which, which we, should, we should be doing and people are. Um, so at Candlestick Park, this shows water reuse efficiency, just some of the types of analysis that we do. Start with the baseline. Everything on the left there is, is water efficiency. So we look at things like um, efficiencies in our irrigation systems, efficient fixtures, efficient cooling systems. Like you mentioned, a lot of water demand goes into cooling. 
um, leak reduction, types of piping we use, um, types of leak protection systems that we can put into place uh, at, the, at the onset of projects. And then everything on the right hand side there is alternative water supplies and we can look at all the various options for alternative water supply and, and where they might be used. We could use alternative, we could use recycled or reclaimed water or harvested water for cooling towers, we could use them for toilet flushing, we could use them for irrigation, and all of those have different treatment requirements. So that's why we put them into different steps there because you want to you want to hit some of those first before you hit the others because it might be harder, you might have to spend more money. Uh, to be able to recycle water for indoor residential use is a little bit more difficult than outdoor non-spray irrigation, for example. Okay. With wastewater optioneering, I kind of talked a little bit about this. We did this at Candlestick Point as well. Um, we like to look at all the gamut of all the wastewater treatment options uh, from the very natural, which is kind of represented there at the top, wastewater treatment, you tend to need to go through multiple steps, pre-treatment, primary, secondary, tertiary, and then polishing, depending on what you want to do with the water afterwards. Um, the natural treatment systems, you can see on the right-hand side there, it's uh, 4.25 hectares for a natural treatment system in that instance, uh, which, is a, which is a lot of space. In an urban environment, that's a huge amount of space. Um, but if you have the space, it makes a lot of sense because you tend to have increasing footprint, but decreasing cost of implementation and de decreasing cost of operation as well as you go towards the more natural systems. So sometimes these fancy MBR things which people tend to throw in there, membrane bioreactor, if you're not sure what that is, it's, a, it's essentially a membrane where you have to force water through the membrane in order to get clean water out the other side, but it takes a hell of a lot of energy and they're very expensive to build. Um, but people tend to sort of throw those at projects, let's do an MBR. And then you think, well, have you thought through all of the other options that might not sound so fancy, but um, which might actually be better for you in the long run? Okay, let's see. I think I may, well, I'll just talk a little bit about this. So, uh, the existing condition at Candlestick Point. Um, all of the stormwater in blue and all of the wastewater in brown was going into a single system and was getting treated at a single wastewater treatment plant. And what they found was it got a little bit of rain, didn't, didn't really need too much. You started getting this overflow from the primary treatment system. So you're having primary treated wastewater, which is really not that good of a standard, um, overflowing into San Francisco Bay. And what we propose and what they are going to be doing is uh, diverting all of the, of the stormwater from the new development area into doing low impact development, stormwater management. Um, and essentially what that does is it eliminates the combined sewer overflows. So you're having the opportunity here to, to do a good thing with stormwater and clean up the bay um, by separating the sewers. This is the Lake Hyacinth. Anyone familiar with water Hyacinth? This is what the lake looks like in the middle of summer. It just looks like a big deal of Hyacinth. So they've got serious eutrophication problems. And so we did a workshop with some people. Oh, Philippe, Philippe Calderon, who's no longer president of Mexico. He, made, he, he wasn't actually meeting with um, Obama on this particular topic, but he did say that he was going to give 3,000 million pesos, which is a lot of money actually, as it turns out, it's about $250 million, um, over the next four years to clean up Gossiquillo. So this was part of that initiative. And we got a little bit of funding to do our phase one work. We met at this um, safari park that was just around the lake. And we got onto this bus. <laughs> we went through the safari, went through Yellowstone. <laughs> we crossed this bridge, and we're wondering where we were going. We we're going to a, this was supposed to be a conference, like a meeting, I think. And we ended up in this kind of, um, I felt like I was in one of those reality shows. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what's the one I'm thinking? Survivor? Survivor? Yeah, because it was like something from Survivor. And we met with all these stakeholders from around the region um, and talked about what needed to be done at Valsakio. And we did end up coming up with a plan which looks something like this, essentially. Do all these things in the urban area, like treat your wastewater and all of that, but also do a lot of restoration opportunities around the lake, things to do around the shoreline, um, as far as erosion control and all that. So I won't bore you with all the details of that, but I think you know the take-home message from this project was that there were lions 
underneath the conference room table. That's pretty much what I went home with. I was like, about the survivor. That was about it. So anyway. No, but it was a, it was an interesting project despite, despite the lions or so what stage of the in development this project is it being accomplished over? They're um, sort of paused as things tend to happen in Mexico. Um, the state group, stakeholder groups are somewhat separated. Um, Philippe Calderon got replaced and uh, the next president hasn't necessarily you know, taken up the charge. We did some of the planning work, but it hasn't moved forward as far as we can tell. It's fun to do that. Did you talk about that today? <laughs> okay, this project was built. So we have some that are built, some that aren't. Newport Beach City Hall just opened in May. Um, we did a water quality management plan. We did all of the engineering design for Newport Beach City Hall. We did all the structural, MEP, and everything. I worked on the drainage and water quality management. It drains to Newport Beach Harbor, which is um, essentially over its pollution limits for just about everything that you can think of. Coliform, sediment, nutrients, <laughs> mercury. <laughs> Pardon? Needles. Needles. Beach. Yeah. Or water. All kinds of stuff. Um, so they needed to do a really good job of meeting their NPDES permit requirements for treating, with, for treating effluent. And we came up with a plan that included um, some detention basins, some swales all along the, the public park area, all the trails and everything. To even every every bit of hard paved surface had some kind of treatment associated with it. There was a dog park and we did a, uh, a neat little sand filter thing for the dog park. Um, I'll just show you some photographs. That's how we divided the watersheds up. And here's some photographs of it recently completed. I'm looking forward to the vegetation growing in a little bit. That would be nice. Um, this is one of our kind of cascading waterfalls on the top left, cascading kind of waterfall detention basins. There's a whole series of them that run down uh, the edge of the new library, right in the middle of, right, you know, right, very noticeable in the front of the main street. So I think bringing these things to the public attention is part of the story here, um, and, and something that I'm sure as designers you're all aware of the need to show our infrastructure and show the things that help us operate and um, you know make people aware of it. This is a little corner detention basin just at the street corner there. This is a bypass so the, the second intake there that you see on the street is the normal storm drain um, and then the low flows go into the smaller uh, intake there and they get diverted into, into a swale essentially that runs along the side of the street. And that was a retrofit. We didn't have to do that actually. We weren't supposed to touch the streets, but we said, hey, here's a really good opportunity to take all this dirty water coming off of that main street and bring it into the site and actually do some, do some, uh, do some good with it. I'm going to skip project, project Pine Tree because it's a long story. I can see a few waiting over there. <laughs> But it was a neat study where we did tidal modeling. This is a 15 minute interval tidal model showing our flushing through the system. It was a, a, a tidal modeling flushing through a lagoon. And uh, essentially the, the main point of this project was that before we came, the client wanted to pump water in and have it recirculate just back to the ocean. And it was a huge amount of water that they needed to do. And we came up with the idea of making sure that we had a system that was operable uh, with no energy and just using tidal flow. Um, and it took a lot of modeling prowess by people who are a lot better at modeling than me um, to figure out how to make that work, but we, we did in the end. It was one of the first projects I, I worked on when I went to Hong Kong, so it wasn't such a bad thing to head down to Phuket and, and work on that project. Um, this is an example, I think, of a, a nice integrated water management strategy for Chonghua Thurba Training Center. Um, which is in Guangzhou. Their Hong Kong Jockey Club is building a new training facility for horses. They say they're not going to be doing any gambling out there, but <laughs> give it a few years, I'm sure it'll start happening. Um, essentially, what what we did was take all of the runoff. So on the tops, on the top part of this slide, you can see all the sort of effluents that are coming into the system, 
Um, we took runoff from all of the tracks, all the landscape areas, uh, all the stable cleaning washdown. Um, there was equine swimming pools that would obviously get dirty, so all the backwash systems from the equine swimming pools went into this recirculation system um, that included pretreatment. In this case, we did do uh, a membrane bioreactor. We had a very confined site after you, you know, eliminate the track and all of that. Um, there wasn't much space for a natural treatment system, and uh, so we, we went with the memory bioreactor. But all of that water is recycled back, so we're recycling. The stable cleaning water is recycled from the stable cleaning water um, and, and stormwater ponds and other things. Um, so that's a, sort of a nice whole system example. Not yet built. Um, and we do, again, I mentioned flood risk and, and resilience is Hong Kong flash flood risk assessment. If any of you have been to Hong Kong, that is Hong Kong Island here, and the entire area is the Hong Kong New Territories. And in 2010, somebody died from a flash flood there. They're very steep terrain. Uh, and the Hong Kong government asked us to do, well, they put it out in tender and we won, and then we did a um, flood risk assessment, mostly using GIS. Uh, as a desktop study, and then we went out into the field and verified risk at the various different catchments and, and highlighted essentially where they needed to do work or put in flood warning systems to prevent that type of loss of life from happening again or loss of assets. That's also an ongoing project. Let's see. I want to show, yeah, I think I'll show you Nam Sang Wai. You guys want to see Nam Sang Wai? Oh, yeah. oh, okay. I think it. I think it's really relevant to our China project. So I'll bring it up, and then if we if we still have the gas, we can um, talk about a few other things. Or maybe I'll just let people ask questions after Namsang Wai. So Namsang Wai is a development. There's a lot of water. Um, it's in Hong Kong. It's mixed use, but mostly residential. All of those little arms coming out into the uh, main water feature there, and all those canals. Uh, those are all residential buildings internally. Um, but there's, you know, if you like clubs and things, I would say it's mostly residential. It's located in an area that's considered a protected wetland as far as all the other surrounding areas. It's sort of a Ramsar, uh, it's not a, a Ramsar designated site, but it's what they call like a management zone. It's where you need to be more aware of what you're doing as far as conservation. Um, and they had to have a balance between the amount of wetland that was getting taken away from this project by this project and the amount that was being added back. Um, so they actually had a whole other site that was for um, improvement of some existing fish ponds that, that, that's not on this, uh, on this map. So essentially our, our scope of work was to look at how to manage that water feature um, to meet the client's objectives, which when you're looking at surface water management, they're all, they're all very similar. So you have water quality to support contact recreation, um, limit algae growth, maintain minimal fluctuations in water levels. We don't like to see you know, big, big level changes um, in the surface water level. Reduce lack reliance on groundwater. In this case, that was the only potential makeup supply that we had, so we had to have a, a balance between uh, the water that was being evaporated out in a hot, dry summer and the amount of water that we would have to, to bring in. We didn't want to rely on municipal supply water, so we had to find an alternative supply. Um, and it had to be low cost. Um, type of system. And so our approach generally is a, is a three-tier approach. We look at water balance and hydraulic controls. Um, we look at all the potential supplies that are going into the system and make sure that we have the right treatment um, for those supplies. And then we look at balancing in lake ecology. And I think balancing in lake ecology is one of those aspects that a lot of people don't think about, but which is very important. Um, everyone, I mean, it, it's, it's sort of a myth that you need circulation for water to be clean, sure, stagnance is a bad word, but if I leave this glass of water here, I could probably still drink it in a few days. So it's stagnant, right? It's not, but it's because it doesn't have nutrients in it. So it's, it's, it's somewhat of a myth that circulation is the key to good water quality or a good management of, of surface water. Um, I think it's, a, it's one that people tend to slip into very easily. And balancing the in-lake ecology goes a, a long way towards having achieving some of those goals um, without the need to do a lot of circulation, a lot of treatment. Um, you can let water sit there, and if it's got a good balance between the primary producers, and I'll get into that in a minute, 
it will stay relatively clean. Um, so some of the things that we do when we look at that three-step approach, um, we build hydraulic models. Uh, I'll show you the example from this one. We look at it. This was this was showing all of our potential water supplies and how we were going to treat all of those water supplies. Um, and then we look at things that we can do in the system itself um, to provide uh, better water quality. Let me get to the hydraulic model, which I actually pulled up here. So for Nam Sang Wai, um, we did a lot of different variations on this, and bathymetry is really important to hydraulic modeling and the way that water flows. So we had water coming into the system through a constructed wetland. This is a big constructed wetland over here, and it went out of the system at the top left corner. And what you're looking at here is water replacement. So this shows, um, as it's progressively getting lighter in the yellow bits, that means that in, that, in this case, 0.6 means that 40% of that water has been replaced um, over the duration of this particular model. And our goal was to have 70% replacement of water. But what we found was that depending on how big a lot of these openings were down in here or, or the, the specific bathymetry, that this is, the, this is the model that actually worked. But in some of the previous models, we found that we would have these bypasses. So water would come in here and it would go straight down here and then straight up to that corner. Um, and leave the system, and the rest of that big lake was not being replaced. Um, so while I did say that flushing and circulation is not the key, it is a tool that we can use to help flush the system when we do have a problem. So if we do get an algae outbreak, or something happens, there's a spill, whatever it is, you need to have the ability to flush, uh, flush the system. So what we tend to do is have a flushing flow, and then a, a, a sort of a lower rate recirculation, which just keeps a little bit of nice clean water coming into the system um, through a recirculated treatment system. And that's what we did here in this case. Okay. So what are the uh, squiggly lines? Uh, of velocity, water velocity. The, the larger ones? Oh, I'm sorry. Those are houses. Those are housing. Those are houses. That's all the land and, and everything that's colored is the water. Okay. Yeah. So like long cul-de-sacs that are out in the middle of the water. So these two? Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So does this take into account? Underground, underground parking. <laughs> it was all, the parking's all below. Really? Water up. So what does this take into consideration the type of uh, the, the below water topography of the soil? How this? The model does. It's, yeah. a, it's a, what you call a two-dimensional depth average model. So every point in the model has a depth associated with it, and that affects water velocity in the hydraulic model. So when we change the bathymetry, that's how we are able to change the flow path and then essentially affect an even distribution of our flushing flows throughout a really complex system like that. Can you go back to the diagram just a minute? Yeah. So the reason why the water was going down south and going back up, was that something yeah. to do with the topography? And it's based on topography and the size of the openings that we have in some of those side channels. So there's something like a venturi effect which you have yeah, so, so these, these channels down in here, we limited the size of these openings in order to get water to flow back up. So normally, initially we thought we would just have water kind of going out into the big lake and then having it come down this way. But eventually our solution ended up by minimizing these openings gradually so that it actually came down here and then flowed back up to the lake and then around and back to the, to the intake. So how did you get it to go? Show me the point source of the water coming. And it's right here. Right there. So it's, go it's going to the right and it's coming over to yeah. the left. So we had to open this one up. Yeah, this you can one. imagine we need a lot more water going through there yeah, right. than we need coming down here initially. So we had quite a big opening there and we limited by the bathymetry. We had some submerged berms that were really shallow right along these areas, uh, which limited the amount of water going down there. When we, when we removed those, we found that there was so much water going heading down that way that it wasn't really working quite right. So, but I mean, there's, there's so many different ways that you can uh, develop the ultimate solution. Um, and you were doing all that our, based upon the model, not? Based upon the model. So we'd run the model and say, oh, well, we've got a problem over here in this part. We need to decrease the size of this pipe or this culvert or put a submerged berm. And those are all area. culverts underneath the road going to each one of those fingers? Yeah, there's there's bridges going over to the fingers here and the culverts go underneath the road, so we would change the size of these openings. So and how so big how big are those? Uh 
one meter uh, culverts, so it's just single All culverts. The way yeah, they 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 vary. So they don't. It's not like an air conditioning system where they change in size and start bigger and get smaller. Yeah, they, they got do? smaller as you got up towards okay. this, the top. They did, but none of them. They weren't huge. They were on the order of one meter smaller, maybe slightly larger. This is occurring on a what time frame? I mean, the full circles. Good question. I think it's uh, 14 days. Mm -hmm. And that would be the. So our replacement, we, our goal, we had to set a target. In this case, our goal was replacement of 70% of the entire lake volume within 14 days. And that helps us, helps, us, helps us to set the recirculation rate. Why 14 days? That's something. Is that something to do with the biohabitat? Has something to do with the um, algae growth cycles. Okay. So you tend to get um, growth of algae blooms. You won't see them until about a week after they've started. Right. But depending on the temperature, mm -hmm. um, that that's a reasonable time frame to do to, to do a flushing flow. But those algae, I mean, they're obviously connected to a tentacle that's rooted in something, right? So the algae the are water responding can usually pass. to light and, and nutrients and the availability of organic matter. So they're just suspended in the water? Suspended. They're not they're just suspended. They're yeah. not tied to anything. Mm -hmm. So the water can't just flow past them and leave them there. No. So they're gonna flush out voids. So the intake was an intake to a recirculation system that included um, some biological treatment um, and sand filters and constructed wetlands. How much time do we have? Or does anyone have any questions? And then if we have some time, I can move on to some other things. Do you want to hear about the energy and water thing? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, work of this is a, a model that was funded by internally by Arab. Arab has a, a research kind of I wouldn't call it a branch. It's more just like a, a pot of money that anybody in Arab can apply to to um, get a bit of that pot and do some research into some of the questions that we think are interesting. And this is a question that I thought was interesting. Because I, I think it started with an architect asking me what was better, literally that question, change a light bulb or change the tap? And I thought about it, and it's actually a pretty difficult question to answer um, if you don't know a lot about your system. So I started developing work on about three years ago. I just put it full screen mode. Which is the water energy resource characterization model. Um, and it starts with these questions, water efficiency, be a more effective energy and carbon strategy than traditional energy efficiency and renewable, renewable energy technologies. I'm going to tell you the answer. It's yes, in case you fall asleep again. Um, can energy efficiency projects be more effective water strategies? So the reverse question uh, than traditional water efficiency and alternative water supply strategies. Is everybody following me here? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, sometimes people get lost right here and they're like, okay. Uh, and the answer to that one is generally no, but sometimes yes. Um, and the main reason is that um, a lot of the water that we extract, particularly in the energy industry, if we're looking at consumption of energy, energy and we go back to the beginning of where it actually consumes water, it consumes water mostly in evaporative cooling, so all the cooling towers for our energy generation facilities. Um, but that's a small amount as compared to the amount that they extract from rivers for, uh, and, and then return back to the rivers. It's all still for cooling, but, the, but what we see coming and evaporating out is just a small fraction. So a lot of that water is returned, so the consumption of water in the energy industry isn't quite as high as the consumption of energy in the water industry. Um, but essentially what Workham does is it, it tries to footprint all of that. It takes water that's consumed and looks at the embodied water, energy, and carbon in water. Um, it, and it takes the energy that's consumed, wherever it's consumed, um, and looks at the embodied energy, water, and carbon. And you can imagine then that there's, there's multiple steps that we have to do and you have to get to some sort of limit. So you could look at the embodied energy in energy in water, or the body embodied water, water that's in the energy that's in the water. <laughs> uh, and 
you start getting a bit boggling, but these are the boundaries that we drew for, for the work on model. Um, we do look at embodied water in energy and water, and we do look at embodied water in energy and energy. Um, doing the, these other ones actually turn out to be quite difficult and actually sort of nonsensical if you try to do it too hard. Um, so let's, let's just take a look at how it works. Essentially, if we start with consumption of water in a building, for example, uh, we have embodied water in that water because we need to, we get evaporation losses in our distribution systems and we have leakage losses in our distribution systems. So that's, if you're from the US, acre feet per acre foot, that would make sense. Does everyone know what an acre foot is? Yeah. Yes, okay, we're from the southwest here. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> southwest. Southwest. Yes, yeah, so um, Most people won't know what that is if I give this anywhere else in the world. Uh, the water that we consume also contains energy. That's for producing the source, so pumping it out of the ground, just, just getting it out of the ground. Um, conveyance, taking it across long distances. Um, that's the pipelines that go over the Tachapi Pass to get the water from uh, the Central Valley in California over into LA. Uh, and then we need energy for water treatment. We need energy to pressurize our distribution system in our cities. And finally, once we've used that water, we need water. We need energy for uh, wastewater treatment. Of course, we also use energy in the home when we consume water, and that's mostly for heating. Um, typically, gas, although in many parts of the world, electricity as well, where they don't have gas supply systems, um, electricity can be used for heating water, and that's a big portion of the energy footprint of water, actually. Uh, and then, if we know how much energy is consumed, we can figure out how much carbon is in all of that. And we can put cost to that if we know how much our water costs and we know how much our energy costs and we know the dollar, dollar value of a ton of carbon. And so then not only can we figure out in that direction where all the costs lie, but we can say how much of that cost is associated with the on-site resource use and how much cost is associated with the off-site resource use just to get the water to, uh, to where we consume it. And we can do the same thing with energy. So we consume energy in a building. We also consume energy for resource extraction, for resource processing, for we have generation efficiencies, and that's a, that's a huge amount. You lose anywhere between 30 and 50%, depending on the process of the energy that's embodied in the material um, in the generation energy generation process. And then, of course, once we've generated the electricity, we have transmission losses. And that's all dependent um, on the particular site, uh, you can't just apply a, a, a number of that so you need to know what the system's like. Um, we also consume water in energy consumption and all of those same processes, resource extraction, resource processing, and, and uh, energy generation all consume water. Uh, and then, of course, we can get a carbon footprint. So what you find once you've created these metrics, and the metrics that we create are all here on, on the right-hand side, so you've got uh, in this case, we've got water and energy, we've got energy and energy, we've, get, we've got carbon and energy, and in the previous case, with the water, we've got water and water, water and, uh, sorry, energy and water, and carbon and water. So once you've created all of those metrics, and you've evaluated your system that you're looking at, and we've done this now for a number of cities, including uh, Manila, Hong Kong, Los Angeles, and Dubai. Um, where we've looked at sort of all of these metrics for those areas. Then you can compare projects. Finally, we get to that point where we can get the answer of what's better, a tap or a, a light bulb. Um, and what you find is that you know energy projects now are water projects, water projects are now energy projects, and they're all carbon projects. Um, and eventually what we spit out are these things that we just uh, call value indexes. This is the total cost benefit value index, but we also have carbon reduction value indexes and, and water reduction value indexes. And what this is saying is that um, all the energy projects here are in orange. There's not that, not as many because I'm a water person. I just have more experience in water projects and know how to evaluate them. But most of the energy projects that I looked at are alternatives um, energy supplies. So things like large wind, micro wind, um, a couple of types of PV, and then efficient light bulbs are, is the one that comes out right on top. So as you move to the right-hand side, this is saying that we recover $6 for every dollar spent, almost $6 for every dollar spent on 
um, efficient light bulbs over the life of a light bulb as compared to one dollar essentially almost a break even on the, on micro end um, so one for one would be a break even but what we find if we look at the uh, energy I don't think I put them in here but if we look if, if we look at carbon value indexes we actually find that things that save hot water perform better than PV as far as energy and carbon efficiency. Um, so you, you get all these nice answers which then help you decide where to spend the money. Um, and it's not just for people like you, for architects, but you could go to governments, you could go to agriculture, all kinds of things, and get carbon incentives uh, for doing all of these types of efficiency projects. Where do governments give the incentives to projects? A lot of them are giving them straight to PV for carbon efficiency. But they should be doing other things, and there's a lot of other types of um, projects that they should be doing that perform much better um, from a carbon perspective. So this whole idea of full uh, resource analysis, I think, is really important in the way that we make decisions, when we set policies. Um, interestingly, there's no protocol right now. For those of you who know about like the whole carbon um, monetization system, trading system, you have to have a protocol in place that's been approved by um, the various uh, agencies that do that essentially issue the carbon credits. You have to have protocols in place for any type of efficiency strategy that's going to essentially reduce carbon. There are not any of those protocols in place for water efficiency measures. So that's one thing that we would like to take this. The next step is to is to start putting protocols in place. For example, if you wanted to do, do you somehow take into account like the amount of time it takes to pay back or get the benefit in mind? Well, yeah, we could probably get that out of here. Um, depends on the life cycle of, so let's say it's five year, it's five dollars per dollar spent, and if the life of an, a light bulb is 20 years, I don't think it's that much, depending on what type of light bulb you have, then it would be 20 or five, would be four years before you got your, about your first investment back on the light bulb. But then you've got another 15 years of life left. Uh, okay, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's the end.